So we'll dig right into it. I know a few of you know me already. For those of you that don't, my name is Chad Masker. I'm the CEO of Carceron. Um, been around in IT for about 17 years. I'm a certified HIPAA security professional. I've been on the MSP Mentor 250 list uh, for several times now, which means I'm amongst the most 250 influential MSP executives in the world. I've been cited in Cobb Focus Magazine on an article on security recently. I was in the top five list for the Metro Atlanta, Metro Atlanta uh, top 10 small business person of the year back in 2010. Uh, now I'm a technology author and uh, I speak at uh, panels all over the country on technology now. In fact, I'm going down to a conference next week to be on a panel. Also, I'm the founder of Speakeasy, which is a cigar club for executives. Uh, it's basically kind of an anti-networking group, a place for uh, executives to get away and have bourbon and scotch and get away from what I call norgies, networking orgies, where you walk up and somebody says, hey, I'm Joe the plumber. Buy plumbing for me. Here's my business card. Uh, just a place for C-level execs to hang out. It's pretty cool. It's actually gaining some traction. Uh, we have interest uh, now in Destin and South Carolina and Utah to expand. Also, I'm proud to report that at the age of 40, I just won the uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Pan Am Championship, uh, the gold medal on that back in March. That was pretty cool, on a torn ACL, no less. And I like to scuba dive. I'll dive anything with water, including a bathtub. And uh, I love wine. I like to learn about it, I like to drink it. So who the heck is Carceron? That's my company. Don't ask about the name, you'll have to get me liquored up for that as far as the name origin, but uh, we were founded in 2002. I have a business partner. We started out of Kennesaw State. Uh, we were recently named to the MSP Mentor 501 list, which used to be the MSP 100 list, but our industry's gotten so big that they had to expand it. But uh, we used to be amongst the top 100 in the MSPs in the world. Uh, we've been named to CRN Magazine's Next Gen 250 list for the past three years now, which means we're considered to be amongst the most innovative companies in our industry. And uh, what I'm particularly proud of is that we are the first in Metro Atlanta to actually have earned CompTIA's managed services uh, trust mark. With CompTIA is actually, if you've heard of like um, computer certifications like A+, Net+, Security+, uh, those come out of CompTIA. This is actually a company level certification. Uh, CompTIA also does lobbying, lots of research, and we're actually the first company in Atlanta to actually earn this trust mark. We're also fully HIPAA compliant. Um, as of September 24th, anybody who is a business associate, uh, that is a company that serves HIPAA compliant, or I'm sorry, covered entities, healthcare providers and health insurance companies, um, they themselves now have to be HIPAA compliant. It's not just a matter of uh, just signing a business associate agreement and saying, you know, we'll keep your patient health records confidential. They actually have to be HIPAA compliant. They actually have to invest in many of the same technologies that hospitals do. They have to uh, follow many of the same policies and procedures, exhibit the same physical safeguards. It's a pretty rigorous process. <clears throat> now let's talk about some uh, door prizes, or I'm sorry, trivia prizes. So to make this thing a little bit more entertaining throughout the presentation, I've got some trivia questions for you, and the prizes are Dining Out cards. Uh, Dining Out magazine you might have seen scattered throughout Atlanta. There's a magazine that's like a review of all the high-end restaurants. The Dining Out card you can buy online for about 125 bucks, and it gives you a discount, 25% off, to any of the restaurants that you see up there. It's like, that's about a third of them, I think. About 65 restaurants here in Metro Atlanta. 25% off the bill, up to four people. Uh, dinner and drinks, 25% off. <coughs> Pretty cool deal, and I've got plenty of cards, so uh, don't be bashful, but that's the prize. And if you don't want a card, then you can go buy one after here, but these are free, so try to engage. So we're gonna jump right into it. Anybody know what year XP came out? First person that gets it right gets a card. 2003. Who said 01 first? 2001, that's correct. So this is actually Microsoft's official announcement um, regarding the end of life for Windows XP, Office 2003. There's not really one for small business server, and small business server, because it's a bundle of products, small business server in and of itself is not officially end of life, but Exchange 2003 is. So by extension, we're saying that it is. But basically what this means is by April 8th, 2014, these systems will no longer get patches no longer get updates. 
You know that annoying, nagging thing you get down by the clock that says, hey, update Windows? Well, if you have those machines, that'll never happen anymore. I know that sounds like a good thing, but here's why it isn't. Hackers are bankrolling, bankrolling? Yeah, bankrolling, banking, <laughs> uh, patches and malware. They're not actually releasing them into the wild right now. They're saving them up for when this day comes. And for the people that are actually sitting on their systems and not upgrading them, come uh, April 9th, you're toast. See ya. So it's not merely a matter of uh, if, but when, right? So here's the next question. I'm not going to read all of that. You can read over it. But bottom line is, does anybody know which act high tech was actually a part of? Which bigger act? Who said C? That's not correct. <laughs> the answer will probably surprise you. What's that? A? Nope. D. It's D. <laughs> Even blind squirrels find this. <laughs> yeah, so high tech was actually brought on board with uh, what we call the stimulus. Why this is important is high tech does a couple of very important things if you're into healthcare that you need to be aware of. And, and you know, why am I leading this conversation off with compliance and not about what should you do with your broken systems? Well, here's why. If you are in healthcare or if you are somebody who serves healthcare, you're su you are now subject to HIPAA compliance. It's no longer just if you're a healthcare provider. If you're a business associate, you now have to be HIPAA compliant so these rules apply to you, right? So HIPAA, when it was passed in 96, wasn't really given the funding needed for enforcement so everybody blew it off. This changes that. This provides the budget <coughs> for enforcement when the government's actually running and turned on. Um, it also allows, interestingly enough, local district attorneys to prosecute at the local level and keep the fines 100% at the local level. Local governments are broke. That's a pretty good deal for them, right? <clears throat> it also more aptly defines what we call, there, there's two things in HIPAA, what they call the privacy rule and the security rule. The privacy rule is more of the policies, procedures, physical safeguards. The security rule is the stuff that the IT guys like me care about. It's the, the geek stuff, the firewall, patching, stuff like that. This gives a lot more definition as to the standards that are required. So that's why this rule is important and it will come back to haunt you as it relates to decisions you make on whether or not to upgrade these systems. Next trivia question. I'll just be quiet until someone says something right. Who said A? Who said A? A is correct. What is that? What is, what is this really? Like, what's the layman? It's retail. What are we talking about? Not retail. Well, credit card. Yep. Credit card processing. It's merchant services. If you take credit cards, this is the standard, the security standard by which you are governed. You must adhere to these standards. And a lot of the security standards in PCI look very similar to HIPAA. In fact, you can see this in a lot of, like, even socks and I think uh, like GLBA, there's a lot of similarities. Thou shalt have a firewall. That, I mean, it's kind of like no duh stuff, right? Thou shalt have a firewall. Thou shalt patch systems. Thou shalt have, you know, unique usernames and complex passwords, stuff that's kind of like, really? I mean, do I have to spell this out? But, you know, a lot of people you do. So the answer is A, yes. Ask TJ Maxx about it. Yeah, ask a lot of companies about it. They're getting burned. Uh, no, ask uh, big who, uh, Adobe. Yeah. Adobe just got burned on this big, 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 like 10 million records in the wild. Huge. So if you have computers that are running merchant services software to swipe your client's credit cards, or if you keep cards on file, and God forbid they're XP, yeah, man. So. 
This really just reiterates what I just told you. Here are the HIPAA and uh, relevant PCI policies that I'm talking about that specifically address why you can no longer use these systems after that uh, expiration date in April. If you continue to do those, you are engaging in an act of willful neglect, and that is findable in both scenarios, okay? And before I get into the meat and potatoes of it, I'm gonna tell you a little dirty secret that I am not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to sell you new hardware. I'm not here to sell you new servers, new workstations. Um, my margin on those things is like non-existent. I could care less what you buy. I make my money selling IT services as a, like a, basically like an outsourced help desk to companies as a flat fee. And I want to support their network, and that's it. It's a high leverage model, almost like insurance. So every time you call me, uh, kind of like insurance, and you make a claim against the policy, I lose money. So my goal is to monitor your network, make sure it's always running, reduce the call volume, so I can basically collect money for doing nothing. Make sense? I mean, it sounds kind of nasty when you say it that way, but that's, that's really what my model is. My model is not selling you hardware. I do it. My customers expect me to do it. And I make money doing projects, but projects require labor. I mean, I have to apply a body to install stuff. I don't really want to, but I'd have to do it. So just, just want to make that clear. I'm not here, this is not a sales pitch. I'm not selling from the back of the room. I'm just trying to educate you on what your options are, whether you buy from me, another MSP, another IT consultant, <coughs> that's it. At the end of the day, I want to sell you managed services. So let's get into it and talk about your options. When I'm talking with a client, as a consultant, usually, thank you so much. As a consultant, uh, I usually go in this order, but you know, as a business owner, I kind of see it usually go the other way. <clears throat> you know, as a salesperson, you're always taught, like, ask the customer, you know, what's your budget, right? How much do you have to spend? And the business owner, you're thinking, well, if I tell him that, then he's gonna make me spend everything I got, right? It's not really the case. Um, I mean, I do want more of your money, I'm not gonna lie. But no, what I, what I really wanna know is, if you're sitting on a big cash reserve and you have capital to spend, then I know that a capital project is okay. That is an option. If you don't have any money in the bank, and we need to do everything OPEX, operating expense, and look at cloud stuff, then that's the only play we have. That narrows the field, right? But I, I don't know what I don't know. Or we can look at leasing options, obviously, too, right? But I, I, can't really, I can't really start pitching you options until I know kind of where your money position is. And then the next piece usually is what your culture is, not necessarily your, your company culture. Like, I don't, you know, I don't need to know you that well, but more about what your tech culture is, how, you're, how tech savvy you are. Are you, are you really like Microsoft Outlook addicted? Uh, a lot of companies are. You know, they, they say they don't like Microsoft, but then you take away that, that Microsoft Office suite and you think they lost their minds. Yeah, so I, I need to know what that technology culture looks like. Then, then we start talking about the high-level stuff, the whiz-bang gears and widgets and blinky lights. Oh, I want to go cloud. What does that mean? What specifically do you want to do in the cloud? A lot of people have cloud goggles. I walked into this one client, or prospect rather. They had just spent $35,000 in new equipment a year and a half ago. They had an outage over the weekend. One of the servers failed, and they had to rebuild it and bring it back up from backup. They were able to restore everything, but it took about a day, so they had a day of downtime. It is what it is. I went in there and looked around. It took about 15 minutes to figure out that the reason, the whole cause of the failure was that whoever set it up was they forgot to plug in a battery cable from the UPS to the server. And this guy was, the whole conversation started with, literally, screw all that stuff. I want to throw it all in the cloud. That's, that's verbatim his words. And I said, I'd love nothing more then for you to scrap that, and I'll sell you all this great cloud stuff and start collecting commission right away. But as like an ethical consultant, I think that you're stupid to do that. You're, you, you haven't realized the investment that you made, and the mistake that you had was 
literally that. It was a mistake. It was human error. It wasn't machine error. The technology is not the problem. Cloud doesn't fix stupid, right? So that's how we start thinking about things. So next trivia question. Does anybody know what section of the U.S. tax code, often called the Hummer SUV deduction, allows you to deduct the cost of certain types of property pretty much the year that you buy it? I thought about putting section eight up there, but a little military humor. You know what I'm talking about. Nobody knows this one? No accountants in the room, really? I get to keep my card? Wow. I thought this was my common knowledge. Are there business owners in the room? Anybody here own their own business? Yeah, okay. People hire accountants. Well, you, you all are going to get like some major education here. Section 179. No card. Awesome. <clears throat> so here's the deal with 179. This is actually, uh, you can thank uh, Bush Jr. for this. Back when everybody was like buying SUVs and, you know, like as an everyday thing. I guess what would that have been, like mid-2000s? Uh, that's why they call it the, the Hummer tax, by the way, because the, the big thing that everybody went and go, uh, did was, you know, Hummers and SUVs. <clears throat> what I obviously want you to pay attention to is, uh, does this thing have a, yeah, is the computer stuff, right? And, uh, you know, maybe some land cabinets or, you know, stuff like that. And also, even if you lease, you can still depreciate it. How cool is that? How cool is that? So make sure you talk to your accountants about this stuff. Now, not every type of lease applies. It's my understanding that there are certain types that do and certain times that don't. And uh, I'm an IT expert, not a financial expert. So if you ask me, well, what kind of lease, Chad? I'm going to be like, no idea. Go read the site or go talk to your CPA. So let's get in the meat of it. I want to start with the core infrastructure and work my way down. So let's talk about small business server. If you're a small business owner and you have small business servers, does everybody know what I mean when I say small business servers? Everybody know what that is? Okay. So Microsoft has or had uh, a couple of different types of Windows server. There's the small business server bundle, which would include a license of uh, Windows server standard, Exchange server, that would be the small business server standard right there. And then if you got small business server premium, it would be Windows Exchange and SQL if you needed to like run an application, right? And that thing ran business for a long time, since probably the late 90s to, well, until pretty much now. Uh, small business server was hot, hot, hot for businesses up to, you know, 75 or so users. Hot sale, I sold a bunch of them. Well, it's dead now, it's discontinued. The last version that you can buy is 2011. It's actually no longer, that line is actually dead. There will be no like small business server 2014. 2011 is the last version of that you can get, period. They want everybody to go to uh, Office 365. So if you're a very small company, <coughs> you're going to get, um, you know, 20 or less users, you're going to go to something called Windows 2012 Essential Server. It's a very cheap Windows server license that has Active Directory for user management, file storage, uh, so on and so forth. And then we'll move you over to Office 365 for email, pull the email off the server. If you're 20 or more users, then we'll put you on a full-blown Windows Server 2012 standard license and then Office 365 Enterprise and move your email to the cloud. Now the reason why I say 20 and not 25, why I don't put you at the bleeding limit of what that particular software allows is you need room to wiggle before you make the transition, right? So pretty much a no-brainer. A lot of people ask, you know, well, when we're making this change, Chad, with the cloud and everything else, do I really need a server? Depends. Uh, are you a regulated business? Are you in healthcare or finance? Yep, gotta have one, sorry. Uh, it's because you need to have definable user accounts and you need to have audit logs and stuff like that. Uh, if you're running a line of business application that will only run on a server, well then by definition, run on a server, then you have to have a server. If you're 10 or less employees and you're fairly, what I would call tech aggressive, then yeah, you can run everything in the cloud, go for it. 
anything more than 10, it gets kind of clunky for companies like me to be able to manage you because you've got multiple user accounts spread out across all these different workstations in work group mode. It's a little awkward. Branch offices, I say yes and no because it depends. Some branch offices now, like a lot of companies are putting everything up in the cloud and then just putting really fat uh, internet pipes to their offices. And if you're doing that, then I say, no, you don't need a server at the office. If you're trying to do kind of a hub and spoke where you have a headquarters, say in Atlanta, and then smaller branch offices that are locations connected by T1 lines, eh, you need a server. Because when you're trying to do stuff over those T1 lines, it's gonna be really slow when you try to like log in, access files, stuff like that. You definitely want, <clears throat> excuse me, you definitely want a server, so. And then the million dollar question is, which email platform do I go to? Well, it depends, are you subject to HIPAA compliance? If you are, you can go, uh, by the way, everything, every, everything in self, means self-host is means buy a server and buy the full, ver uh, full version of Microsoft Exchange and uh, host it yourself. Office 365 is obviously cloud. And then there's Google Apps. Well, if you're subject to HIPAA compliance, Google Apps is not an option, period. Google will not sign a business associate's agreement and by extension will not become HIPAA compliant. So if you are in healthcare or in health insurance, you may not use Google Apps. That is Gmail, that is Google Apps Premier, Google Apps for Business, any version, any derivative of Google, any doctor that is using a Gmail address is in violation of HIPAA, period, in any way, shape, or form. Is the company addicted to Outlook? You know, again, you know, stick with Exchange on site or Office 365. Uh, are you cheap? Google Apps is your huckleberry. Um, do you like sticking in your browser all day? You, do, you don't mind that? That's, you know, really, really, this one's kind of the, this is digital divide right here. This is uh, if you're kind of younger generation, never known a life without the internet. That's this group, and they're like, Google Apps all the way, that's fine, we don't care. Uh, old school, you know, we want our Outlook, we want nice feature-rich email experience. You know, they, they want to stay over here. <clears throat> Generally, not always. Uh, need to collaborate on documents, uh, like real-time collaboration. Office 365 and Google Apps both do this. Um, the consensus in my industry is that Google Apps still does this a little bit better than Office 365. To be fair, Office 365 is a little late to the game in this particular technology. I'm sure they'll catch up pretty quick. And then, you know, this is kind of no-brainer. You know, if you have mostly Android, then Google Apps is gonna work better than, you know. And then down here, if you have Windows stuff, then stick with Microsoft stuff, right? Replacing Windows XP, the only thing you've really gotta look at here is we are not fans of Windows 8 and not many people are. Um, they are due to release 8.1 anytime now. If they may already have done it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I haven't paid attention, don't really care. Uh, Windows 8's really great if you have a touch screen. If you don't, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell you. It, it's very clunky. Uh, they are bringing back like a taskbar and a start-ish button, but we just, we, it, it, we've had overwhelmingly negative feedback from our user base. We just said, forget it. Everybody gets Windows 7. Uh, you know, if you want a touchscreen type tablet Windows experience, then yeah, maybe play with eight. But seven down the board. And then, you know, the one exception is I did have, a, I've, I've got two scenarios now. We've got clients that are like, look, we've got these machines. All they do is sit there and they, basically they use them as like time clock machines, right? I mean, they're just nothing. Like we don't want to blow like five, 600 bucks on a new computer. Can't we just get the upgrade software and just let them sit there and keep collecting more dust? And I'm like, sure. 160 bucks, slap the Windows 7 upgrade disk in there. You're compliant, wait till it breaks, you're good to go. <clears throat> the better scenario on that might be though, is to find somebody with an older workstation, swap it out to replace that time clock and then upgrade theirs. But however you wanna play it, it's fine. Uh, now, here's the really big trick question. I mean, we, we don't need to think so linear anymore, right? It's like we assume when we have a Windows desktop, we've got to replace it with a Windows desktop, and the answer's not always, right? Sometimes you can replace it with a tablet or even a uh, Chromebook. I actually brought one, I believe. Can't tell any difference, just tablet, right? But uh, all a Chromebook is is pretty much a notebook with a browser. So, again, it's, it's 
not so much about, well, I mean, it is about the technology, but it's about how you use it. And it's about the comfort level of the users. Uh, it's a little bit about digital divide. And it's about how you input data. So you have to understand, first and foremost, tablets suck. Absolutely suck at inputting data. They are consumption devices. Unless you can, like you have the ASUS transformer, and even then, I, I've got one of those, it's still a little bit clunky. You want like a full-fledged laptop or one of those. Um, if it's simple, form entry, stuff like that, like, you know, like nurses, where you can just kind of, like you're just doing check boxes or radio buttons, tablets are okay. But other than that, you know, if you're just doing hardcore data entry, probably want to stick back with Windows. Um, if you're 100% in the cloud and, and or Google Apps, Chromebook might be an option. Chromebook's kind of a very niche select, it's kind of one of those perfect storm scenarios. Somebody have a question? Okay. Oh, trivia time. Cool. Anybody? Who said both? You got two cars? What are you going to do with two of them? And I bought them in my spring. Well, you got to give them out as gifts. <clears throat> can anybody explain? Can you explain why it's both? Um, traditionally, when you buy software from Microsoft, you pay them a amount of money and the software belongs to you. Um, you've got to pay them every year now, um, or they'll turn off your software, mm -hmm. which blows. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, they're both kind of the correct answer. So, <clears throat> easiest way to explain this. A license, I mean, you never really own software anyway, right? I mean, when you bought it off the shelf, you don't really technically own it. You've purchased a license, a license to use it, but you still legally own it, right? Um, but <clears throat> a license is the old school way. It's the box on the right. That's what you buy off the shelf at Best Buy. The box on the left is the subscription. Now, speaking purely, Office 365 is, basically it's a bundle of services from Microsoft that includes this as a subscription, but also includes, uh, usually includes, well, always includes a suite of cloud services of varying types. Hosted Exchange is usually in there. Microsoft Link, uh, Cloud, uh, is it uh, SkyDrive? SkyDrive is in there. Um, SharePoint, hosted SharePoint, which is like their company intranet website collaboration tool. So, Office 365 is kind of like a, almost like a value bundle of stuff, right? So you're you're, you're kind of getting the Office 2013 as a subscription split out, so you don't have to pay that big $400 but you also get a bunch of other stuff with it, okay? The other thing that's cool about Office 365, depending on the license you get, I think this is true of all of them though. Um, yeah, that says it up top. Uh, one one uh, subscription, it gets you uh, five licenses. See it up top here? How awesome is that? One of these lets you install that on five machines. It's pretty cool. Talk about Office. Uh, again, this, you know, none of this is, I think, real big rocket science. If you're cheap or broke, Google Apps is your huckleberry. <laughs> um, if you're upgrading from Small Business Server and you love Outlook, uh, remember we talked earlier about the upgrade paths from Small Business Server. If you're small, then you're going to go Enterprise and buy Office 365. If you're bigger, then you're going to buy <laughs> Windows Server Standard and buy, go Office 365. But pretty much where your email's going is Office 365. And because you're buying that subscription, you're also getting the office licenses, right? If you've already got Small Business Server or Exchange, or you've already got, you know, more current versions of Office, then, you know, what do you care? Don't, don't buy it. I don't, you know, leave it alone. I mean, it's up to you. Uh, this just kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what to look at. So we're going to wrap up with a few scenarios, just kind of show you how I think and, and, and what, how I would present something to somebody in terms of, um, you know, making a consulting decision and uh, giving them some advice. So let's meet uh, Miley. She's the Spunky Real Estate Group. 
She's the owner of uh, an SBS server. She bought it in 07. She uses it pretty much just for email and file storage. She has no applications on it. She does a lot of field work, um, or her employees do a lot of field work, contract signings, photos of properties, et cetera. She's interested in learning how tablets can streamline our day-to-day -day operations. She's got seven employees. They're all under 35 years or less. Um, and she's still recovering from the real estate market crisis. So funds are pretty snug. So in her case, two things stand out right away, right? The company's young, primarily young people, and they're broke. So Google Apps, definitely the way to go. And then because they like, they do a lot of like file sharing and collaboration uh, for the properties that they manage, Google Drive might be okay. Oh, there's no Drive icon up there, but okay. Google Drive might be okay, but we'll probably put them on something called Box, a little bit more advanced file sharing and collaboration. For the five field agents, we'll put them in Google tablets, Android tablets, sorry. And then for her office assistant, give her like a Windows 7 desktop. And then, you know, she might want like a Windows 8 tablet with a docking station because she's quirky or whatever. But that's it. Pretty straightforward, right? So scenario two is a little different. This is Saul. Saul bought his small business server in 2004 when he only had 10 employees. He's since grown to a 50-person firm. He's old school and he's not fond of anything being in the cloud, but he's coming around to the idea of at least letting email be hosted. Uh, runs a practice management system that is currently using SQL Express. That's like a free version of SQL. And he was told by his practice management system vendor that his databases are way too large. He's going to have to migrate to the full version of SQL, like the expensive version. He's considering investing in another line of business applications to streamline his firm's operations. His partner and associate lawyers have been complaining about their inability to multitask and perform document review efficiently from their old Windows XP PCs. And most of his clients are uh, healthcare providers, so he actually is subject to HIPAA compliance as a business associate. And uh, he has a huge pharmaceutical client in New Mexico that's made him very wealthy. Money and access to credit are not an issue. So this scenario is a kind of, it's really pretty straight up. He wants to replace his servers and he wants to beef things up and he's grown. In his case, we're gonna buy two pretty beefy physical servers and we're gonna put five virtual servers on them. So if you've done the math, it's like 12 servers, right? So it's like, Chad, why did he, why'd you take him from one box to 12? That seems like overkill. <clears throat> well, the server virtualization, we're gonna take this one box, we're gonna put his domain controller on one virtual server here, move his line of business application server over here, and then he's going to have three spare virtual servers to do with what he wants. Because remember, he said he was exploring some other applications. He wanted to streamline his business. He wanted some room to grow and add other applications. So he's going to have those three other servers to do that. The cool thing about the second box is if any of these fail, they're cross-replicating in real time. This one kicks in and they just keep running. Business never goes down. That's why he has the 12 servers. And he loves it. Because for lawyers, time is money. Right? He's got a lot of it. Office 365, you know, he's not really a big fan of the cloud, but he's ready to move his email out of there because he's had a lot of problems getting black, his IP address blacklisted and stuff like that. So he's like, you know, just get the email out of here. That'll be easy. And uh, he was really happily surprised, like most people are, that you get five licenses per employee. So no brainer there. We put in some HP desktops, dual monitor. So now the lawyers can actually see two screens at once, two documents at once. And, uh, you know, he's going to spend a huge chunk of change. And he's going to be able to depreciate it all this year, thanks to, uh, depreciate it all this year, excuse me, thanks to uh, Section 179 of the tax code. Last up, Fogey Care, my favorite one. So, uh, remember, these are all based off somewhat of true stories. They're either based off of a client experience. This particular one's kind of a hybrid of two clients. Um, they're based in West Palm. Uh, over 25 outpatient clinics across the country, and they provide in-home care. Um, they've got about 20 servers in their own data center, and uh, a bunch of them are 2003, four some lightweight, not really hardcore 2008 servers, bunch of desktops all running Windows XP, and then a mixture of Office 2003 and 2007 broken down like that. They use Google Apps for email. 
Um, they like all of their line of business applications. They don't use Office much, but they do use Outlook a lot for email. And before you ask, yes, there's a connector for Outlook that lets you connect to Google Apps. Um, the only reason they are even talking with us is that they are worried about going out of HIPAA compliance when support for Windows XP and Office 2003 expires. Right up there, right? Um, due to ongoing issues with Medicaid and their government contracts, cash flow can be inconsistent. They might capitalize the project, but they want financing options too, right? So trivia question, right out the gate, before we even talk about upgrading his hundreds of Windows XP computers, he has a much bigger problem that we have to fix right now. Anybody remember what it was? Man, yes. That's what I'm talking about. He's paying attention. He is not allowed to be on Gmail. No, no, no. That's got to go. What's great about Office 365, and to be fair, I'm not a Microsoft like fanboy at all. Um, my company, Gmail. But if you're HIPAA compliant, if you need to be HIPAA compliant, you got to be down here. I can be, I can use Gmail because I'm not transmitting PHI, even though I have to be HIPAA compliant. Does that make sense? But I'm not a hospital, right? Does that answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> so, anyways, you can read that, but you get the point. Um, and then we're going to talk about replacing all of his desktops. So for those treatment rooms, we're actually going to, we, we talked to his EMR vendor, and as much as we hate Windows 8, they've actually, uh, EMR is electronic medical record system. Uh, they're actually going to upgrade their system to be like Windows touchscreen compliant. So we're like, okay, cool. So we'll get these like cool, really cool, like new all-in-one touchscreens and put them in the treatment room so it'll look all sexy and the nurses can just go in there with their fingers and do whatever and not use the keyboards as much. And then for the nurses in the field, we'll kind of give them that same look and feel, but you know, obviously they can't lug that around. That looks a little heavy. So we'll give them one of those instead. It's a little Microsoft Surface tablet. And then for the office and administrative staff, you know, those are primarily some old school people. They want Windows 7 mostly. Uh, they only go on the EMR system for reports and stuff. So Windows 7 Pro and Office and go with it. Now, what we didn't talk about, and what you might have seen up there was he had a bunch of Windows 2003 servers. They weren't small business servers. They were Windows 2003 standard. 2003 standard itself, by itself, without the small business server bundle, doesn't expire until July 2015. So technically, he's safe for now. But here's the thing. He's about to upgrade about, what, 350, 400 desktops? And he's looking at a lease. So if he's got to upgrade another, what, dozen, 15 servers, whatever it was, might as well just go ahead and throw them in there now. You can do it now or you can do it a year from now, right? So we'll just wrap it all up and get it done. So he's a very happy camper. We're going to get it all done. Um, oh, yeah, final thought. And this actually came from the real-life client scenario. Uh, you know, we talked about kind of dealing with the symptoms as they were. But in all reality, he's in West Palm Beach. What the hell is he doing with a data center in West Palm Beach? Um, he needs to move his stuff to the cloud that's not near a beach, um, especially a medical data center. Hello? Anyways, that's it. So here's my uh, final message for the day. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the swag to back this up. It did not get shipped here in time. But if you go to the site, you can get this swag. These are really cool posters. These are my, my version of motivational posters. Those of you that know me, this is kind of how I roll. Uh, this is the biggest one I have at either side of the monitors of my not network operations center at my office. I think they have other ones like Innovate or Die. Um, yeah, there's some other nasty ones I won't say. But uh, we also have these coffee mugs, too, that are really good. But that's the website you get it from. Anyways, uh, in summary, you know, don't wait. Um, start planning your migrations now with whoever you're person is, um, because time is short, especially if you're in healthcare, you need to start planning it now, uh, especially if you want to take advantage of the Section 179 deduction, you really got to start planning now because you've got, you know, by the time you really get back and start thinking about it, you've got, what, two and a half months left because you got to get it done in this tax year. So, you know, that's, you really got to get going on it. Um, and if you're looking at cloud options, please, please, please get help. 
I don't care if, if you don't call me, just call someone. It's not as easy as it sounds. Don't get cloud goggles. 